Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our anesthesiology playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about pharmacokinetics. Today, it's time for pharmacodynamics. With that said, now let's get started. Please watch these four videos in this playlist in order. Let's answer the questions of the previous video. First question, should the patient stop the beta blockers on the day before surgery? Next, should the patient stop the beta blockers on the day of surgery? The answers to both questions is shut up. You do not stop them before surgery. You should take beta blockers now. You should take the beta blockers on the day of the surgery and you should continue to take the beta blockers even after the surgery. Otherwise, if you stop them, the beta-1 receptor will be upregulated, leading to increased heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, blood pressure, which increases your ischemic risk. Anesthesia is general, regional, or local. General is inhaled or IV, regional is neuraxial, limb, or others, local is ester or amides. You need to know every single word in this chart. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to the drug, but pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to your body. We have talked about pharmacokinetics in the last video. Don't forget absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. This is pharmacokinetics. Now it's time for pharmacodynamics. What your drug does to your body. Here's the drug, here's the receptor. The drug is gonna get attached to the receptor, like a key in a lock, like a truck in a dock. The receptor could be on the outside or on the inside. Here is the ligand, here is the receptor. And I've told you before, whenever you have a disease with type 1 and type 2, usually type 1, the problem is in the ligand, type 2, the problem is in the receptor. Case in point, diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. In my physiology playlist, we have talked about functions of proteins in the cell membrane. And as you recall, cell membrane proteins are either integral or peripheral. Integral, the channels, the carriers, the pumps. Peripheral, enzymes, receptors, GPI, anchor proteins. Does anyone remember paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria? Cell membrane proteins, structural, integral, and peripheral. Integral channels carriers, and the channels could be gated or non-gated. However, the peripheral, they are the receptors, the enzymes, the G proteins, the identity proteins. Today, it's time to talk about receptors. Receptors are proteins. All of your receptors are proteins, no exception. All of your receptors are proteins. When Romeo met Juliet is when the ligand meets the receptor. And then what's gonna happen when they meet each other? You can open or close a channel. You can stimulate or inhibit a pump. You can start a genomic action. During rest, your resting membrane potential is negative. The inside is more negative. Okay, why? Because potassium is leaving. What happens if sodium enters? You will get depolarized. You will get activated. What happens if chloride enters? This is negative. You become more negative. This is inactivation. GABA or gamma amino butyric acid is a freaking neurotransmitter. Is it stimulatory or inhibitory? It is inhibitory, so GABA will inhibit you. But if what if you have two GABA neurons following each other? Oh, inhibition of the inhibition is excitation. We call this double inhibition or disinhibition. The loss of the loss is a gain. Let's talk about the GABA. A GABA is like this. Oh, amazing. That's an amazing complex receptor. It has a chloride channel within it. Benzodiazepines will bind here, barbiturates will bind here, and GABA will bind here. So if I'm taking benzodiazepines, benzodiazepines are binding here, GABA is binding here, and the chloride channel will be open to let the chloride in. When a negative comes in, the inside of the membrane becomes more inhibited. Hashtag inactivation. Hashtag sedation. And that's why benzodiazepines are sedatives and hypnotics. Barbiturates, also sedatives and hypnotics due to chloride influx. Benzodiazepines increase the frequency of the chloride channel opening, but barbiturates increase the duration. Please watch the previous video. If you are lipid soluble, you will just diffuse through the membrane until you reach the nucleus. But if you are water soluble, we have to put a receptor on the outside. How can we bridge the gap between the ligand on the outside and the nucleus on the inside? Here comes the middleman, the G protein, connecting the receptor on the outside to the enzymes on the inside. Don't forget that alpha-2 is anti-sympathetic. The great drug dexmedetomide is an alpha-2 agonist. It inhibits the release of norepinephrine. It's anti-sympathetic. And that's why you calm down. That's why it is an anesthetic. 
How do opioids work? Opioids bind to this receptor. It is GI coupled. Okay. GI is what? I for inhibitor. It's going to inhibit this neuron. How did you inhibit the neuron? Two mechanisms. Number one, I opened the potassium channel. Potassium efflux happens. Potassium is positive. When a positive leaves, the inside becomes more negative. Hashtag inhibition. Moreover, I closed the calcium channel, prevented the calcium from entering the cell. Calcium was responsible for activation and rupturing those vesicles and secreting the neurotransmitter. None of this is going to happen. And this is inhibition. How did opioids inhibit your neuron? They open the potassium channel, they close the calcium channel. They allowed more potassium efflux, they prevented calcium influx. Aspartate and glutamate are excitatory neurotransmitters, but GABA and glycine are inhibitory. Glutamate is excitatory. Glutamate has NMDA receptor and AMPA receptor. If you want to learn how is this related to schizophrenia, please get my CNS pharmacology course on my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. Glutamate is excitatory. Glutamate receptor is part of glutamate, so it's excitatory. But what if you block the receptor? Oh, you get an inhibitory effect. What are the medications that block that receptor? They are many, including filbamate, ketamine, methadone, PCP, dextromethorphan, memantin, and rilazole. Mechanisms of action of some of these anesthetics. Let's go. Propofol, how do you work? I work by stimulating the GABA, and GABA is inhibitory. How come? GABA opens chloride channels, increase chloride influx. When the negative enters, the membrane becomes more negative on the inside. Hashtag inhibition. Diazepam, midazolam, the razepams are benzodiazepines. Stimulate the GABA, opens chloride channel, neuroinhibition. Thiopentale, methohexatale are barbiturates. GABA, open the chloride channel, and then neuroinhibition. Atomidate, which intimidates your adrenal cortex, also can work by cementing the GABA and then opening the chloride neuroinhibition. How about opioids? GI coupled, open potassium channels, close calcium channels, hashtag inhibition. Dexmedetomide is alpha-2 agonist. It also causes this leading to neuroinhibition. Ketamine inhibits the glutamate receptor known as NMDA. And when you do this, you inhibit because this was excitatory. When you inhibit it, you become inhibitory. Have you noticed that all of these drugs cause neuroinhibition? Yeah, that's why they are anesthetics. Well, no duh. Let me remind you of something because the potassium channels and calcium channels are so profound. Do you remember the story of insulin secretion from the beta cells of the islets of the Langerhans and the pancreas? Sure, glucose entered into the pancreatic beta cell. And then, of course, the first step is to add a phosphate. Why do you, why do you have to add phosphate every time in biochemistry? Because otherwise, the glucose that comes in can just leave. Oh, so you mean that you are trying to fix it inside the cell? Sure, because phosphate fixes stuff. Now, glucose 6-phosphate will increase the ATP to ADP ratio because this is glycolysis, remember? Yeah, when you increase this, you will close the potassium channels. Potassium will stay in the cell, causing depolarization. When the positive stays inside, it is activation. And this opens calcium channels. Calcium comes in, releases the insulin from the vesicles, and now insulin is in the blood. In order to secrete something, in order to be excitatory, you need to close the potassium channel, but open the calcium channel. Close the potassium, open the calcium. Conversely, what's going to happen if I open the potassium but close the calcium? No release. And this was the mechanism of action of opioids. Hashtag inhibition. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. This is the story of insulin release. This is the story of opiates. What's an agonist? What's an antagonist? An agonist is something that looks like the original ligand and it binds to the same receptor and gives you the same effect. Oh, so it's a pro. It's not an anti. It's a pro. Amazing. How about an antagonist? That's an anti. Okay. This is the antagonist. It looks like the original thing. It binds to the receptor. Same receptor for that matter. It could be another receptor. The end result is no effect. I will bind to this receptor and nothing will happen. See, see that? Yeah, listen to me, Ligon. I'm gonna take your place. I'm gonna bind to your own receptor, but I will not produce your effect. I'll produce, ah, nothing. There is a myth that is rampant in the culture. People think that antagonist will give you the opposite effect of the agonist. Shut up. Antagonist gives you no effect. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not the opposite. 
So let's say that the original ligand increased my heart rate. What will the antagonist do? It will not increase my heart rate. Oh, how about decrease my heart rate? Oh, shut up. So if Ben Shapiro became a pharmacist, he will tell you, and the idea, and the idea, and the idea that an antagonist to X causes opposite effect to X is absolutely asinine. Okay, folks, you're confusing categories here. An antagonist is not the same as inverse agonist, not by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a pharmacist now. My wife is a doctor. Okay, medicosis, so if beta agonist stimulates the beta-1 receptor, what would you get? You will get increase in heart rate. Okay, what if a beta blocker, an antagonist, Okay, it will bind to the same receptor. And then what? Will it decrease the heart rate? Oh, shut up. It will prevent the increase in heart rate. And then what's going to happen? If you block the sympathetic on the heart, who's going to take over? The parasympathetic. Now the vagus is unopposed. And the vagus will decrease your heart rate. So it's not that the beta blocker decrease your heart rate. No, no, no. Beta blockers block the receptor. And then the vagus is the one that decreased the heart rate. Big difference. Some doofus asked Warren Buffett one day and said, how can I invest my money wisely? Warren Buffett replied, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. How can I treat arrhythmia wisely? Rule number one, don't let the beta one get stimulated. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. Here's a beautiful graph. Drug dose here, or plasma concentration, and here is the effect of the freaking drug. Okay, if you give me a full agonist, I'll get 100% of the effect. Amazing. How about partial agonist? Less than 100%, but more than zero. Okay, what's an antagonist? Oh, it will do the reverse. Oh, shut up, shut up. Antagonist will do nothing, so it's zero effect. Oh, but the inverse agonist, or the super antagonist, is the one that is taking me to the negative. This is the opposite effect to the agonist. However, the antagonist gives you no effect. Receptor upregulation versus receptor downregulation. Let's say I had two receptors here. Upregulation is when you increase the numbers of the receptor. What is downregulation? When you decrease the number of the receptors. Can you give me an example of these phenomena? Sure. Liver LDL receptor. What happens when you give statins? The liver stops making de novo cholesterol inside the liver. Therefore, what's going to happen? The liver is going to borrow some LDL from the plasma into the liver trying to make new cholesterol. Okay, so this is what? This is LDL receptor upregulation, trying to collect more LDL from the bloodstream. The other example is the beta-1 receptor. Let's start by statin. You ate the double cheeseburger. Absolutely delicious, but contains lots and lots of fat. Fat from the diet equals dietary cholesterol here. But don't forget, there is dietary cholesterol and there is de novo cholesterol by the liver. These are not the same. This is exogenous because from the burger, but this is endogenous. Your liver made it. And then your liver is going to dump it in the blood, VLDL, IDL, LDL, and then all of, you know, the rest of the story, right? What if we give statins? Statins will inhibit your HMG coeductase. You will not be able to make de novo cholesterol. As a result, the liver will increase its uptake of the LDL from the plasma by upregulating its LDL receptor. Instead of having one receptor, now we have five. Another example is the beta-1. Okay, let's stimulate the beta-1 receptor. How do we do it naturally? Okay, your neuron secretes norepinephrine. What kind of neuron is this? Sympathetic. The sympathetic that goes to the heart. Uh, sympathetic is thoracolumbar. If you're talking heart, this is thoraco. Basically T1 to T4. From the lateral horn cell to be specific. Lateral horn cell, and then you go to this beautiful anterior or afferent root, and then the spinal nerve, and then you go to the heart, and you release norepinephrine. Only. The nerve fiber cannot release epinephrine. Only norepinephrine. The only organ that can secrete both norepinephrine and epinephrine is your adrenal medulla because it has the PNMT enzyme, phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase. Okay, let's stimulate the beta-1 by norepinephrine and or epinephrine. Beta-1, when it gets stimulated, it increases heart rate and stroke volume. This is contractility. And now you have what? Increased cardiac output and this can increase your blood pressure. Okay, let's inhibit the beta-1. Give me a beta blocker to block the beta-1. Now what's going to happen? Heart rate is not going to increase. But the parasympathetic is still available, so heart rate will decrease. What will beta blocker do to the stroke volume? It will inhibit the rise in the stroke volume. However, the parasympathetic now predominates. Stroke volume is going to decrease, cardiac output decrease, blood pressure decreases. What if you stopped the beta blocker suddenly? Oh, suddenly you stopped it. Oh, now the heart is hungry for some beta-1 stimulation. Look at this. Too much stimulation of the beta-1, 
too much increase in heart rate and stroke volume, too much increase in cardiac, too much increase, that's dangerous. This is pro-arrhythmic. And that's why if you remember the question at the beginning of the video, Hey doctor, I take beta blockers and I have surgery next week. Should I stop the beta blockers? Shut up. Should I stop the beta blockers on the day of the surgery? Shut up. Like, should I, should I take them before the surgery on the day of the surgery? Yes, you should. Should I continue taking them after the surgery? Yes, you should. If you have done everything you should. You should never stop the beta blockers suddenly. What else should not be stopped suddenly? Steroids. Otherwise, adrenal insufficiency can ensue. Potency versus efficacy. Efficacy, you see, you see that line? Yeah, this is 100% efficacious. That's amazing. How about potency? Well, if this is the midline, okay, anything that shifts me to the right decreases potency. Anything that shifts to the left will increase potency. You don't believe me? Okay, so here is you have a line in the middle, one to the left, one to the right. In order to solve this thing mathematically, try to figure out a line that will cut through all of these three doofuses, okay? And then from the beautiful line, you go down here. So I go here this way until I intersect here and I go down. Amazing. And then continue, continue, continue until you intersect with the second doofus and then you go down. Perfect. And then continue, continue, continue. You intersect with the third doofus and you go down. Let's compare these three points. Here's point one and here's point two and here's point three. Okay, this was 50% efficacy. Amazing. If you see the green drug right here, just 100 milligrams of that drug gave you 50% efficacy. Look at the second drug. Oh, it needed 400 milligrams to reach the same stinking efficacy. Look at drug three. It needed what, like a thousand. Wow, a thousand micrograms in order to give me the same 50% efficacy. Therefore, among one, two, and three, which drug is more potent. Of course, one doofus, it can give you the same efficacy at the lowest possible dose. This is my man. This is a potent medication. Next, let's talk about the ceiling effect. I mean, who wrote the textbook? Hillary Rodham Clinton. What's the ceiling effect? If you see here, look at this drug. I'm going up, up. The efficacy is increasing, increasing, increasing until I plateau. This plateau is hitting the ceiling. Beyond the ceiling point, even if you increase the dose, ah, efficacy is not going to increase because I've already plateaued. I've reached my ceiling. The only thing that you will get by raising the dose past that point is increased in adverse effects and God forbid, toxicity. Oh, by the way, what's the difference between side effects and toxicity? Side effects happen with the normal dose. Toxicity happens with the overdose. Most people unfortunately use the two terms interchangeably because they are doofuses. Potency versus efficacy. Okay, look at these three. Who is more potent? Of course, one is more potent. As you go here, potency increases. As you go this way, potency decreases. How do you tell the difference? Try to figure out a line that will cut through all of them and then go down. Okay, nice. How about the efficacy? Now, here are the three graphs. Now, what is going to be the line that's going to cut through these three doofuses? In this case, it will be a line that goes like this, vertically. Okay, let's do it. So I gave a certain dose, X, and drug C gave me 50% efficacy. Drug B gave me 80% efficacy. At that same dose, drug A gave me 100% efficacy. Ergo, which one is more efficacious? Of course, drug A. Pharmacology makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Synergy, additive versus antagonist. What is synergism? One plus one equals three, which is a mathematical insanity, but a pharmacological reality. That's why we give penicillin with aminoglycosides. That's why we give isoniazid, rifampin, and streptomycin for refractory tuberculosis. How about additive? 1 plus 1 equals 2. And this could be a good thing or a bad thing. Ciprofloxacin plus metro is a good combination. Loop there is an amino glycoside is a horrible combination. This is O2 toxic. And this is also toxic to your ear. Add them together. Say goodbye to your ear. If I've ever heard that you gave a patient loop derex and an amino glycoside, I will smack your gluteus minimus, metaphorically speaking. What's an antagonist? 1 plus 1 equals 0. Combining penicillin and tetracycline together is a stupid. 
By the same token, combining clindamycin and erythromycin is pointless. So synergy is 1 plus 1 equals 3. What is time synergism? Time synergism was discussed before in this anesthesiology playlist. Why do we add epinephrine to the local anesthetic? Because it constricts the vessel, prolonging the action of the local anesthetic. When you prolong the action of the local anesthetic, this is time synergy. Competitive inhibition versus non-competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibitor is like the capitalist pig. The non-competitive antagonist is like Nancy the Karen. Uh, forgive my jokes. What's up with that greedy capitalist? Okay, you opened a used car shop. I'm gonna open a used car shop just next to your shop and take your business. I'm gonna bind to your own receptor. I'm gonna take your own customers and drive you out of business. Just because. The non-competitive antagonist is Nancy the Karen. Well, uh, when my kids play, I do not let them compete with each other. They do not keep score because in my house, everyone is a winner. Every child is a winner. This non-competitive behavior will lead to inhibition and her kids will need therapy. Can you imagine being reared by a Karen? I would rather lose two fingers in a garbage disposal. Non-competitive inhibition. So here is the antagonist. I will bind to another recept. I will not compete with you because competition is from the devil. But the end result is the same. No effect. Okay, let's have a graph for competitive antagonist. Same thing here. The story of the greedy capitalist. I will bind to your own receptor and will decrease your potency. So this is the agonist only, but this is the agonist plus the competitive antagonist. What happened to the potency? Decreased because I shifted to the right on the x-axis. What happened to the efficacy? Look at the y-axis. Did it change? No, I'm still here. So no change in efficacy. Can you overcome this by increasing the dose of the agonist? Sure, if I increase the agonist too much, at a certain point, you will hit that greedy capitalist in the butt and buy into your own receptor. Take your own customers back. And this will increase your potency back to the baseline. Non-competitive antagonist. Now you will bind to a different receptor without competing. What's going to happen to the efficacy of Karen's kid? It will drop like a rock. What happened to the potency? Well, for potency, let me look at the x-axis. Okay, look at this. Yeah, did not change. The x-axis is the same. Yeah, I can actually measure it from here to here. Yep, same. Did not change the x-axis. So, this point did not change. No change in potency. But what happened to the efficacy? Look at the y-axis. I went from 100% to 50%. The efficacy has decreased. Can you overcome it by adding more agonists? No one can overcome Karen. Next, stereospecificity of drug. This is stereochemistry. If you remember stereochemistry or stereoisomers, we have the dextro to the right and levo to the left. What's going to the right and the left? The plain polarized light. Go back to your chemistry classes. If I have two drugs, one is in the D form, one is the, in the L form, this can lead to two different pharmacokinetics and two completely different pharmacodynamics. Example, D, bupivacaine versus L, bupivacaine. D, bupivacaine inhibits sodium channels for a longer period of time compared to the levo counterpart. And of course, if you inhibit the channel longer, you will have more side effects Hashtag cardiotoxicity. What if there is a drug and the drug is 50-50? 50% D, 50% L. We call this the racemic mixture. There is a wonderful old book titled How to Lie with Statistics. It helps you decipher true statistical figures from pseudo-fake manipulating misleading statistics. Let me give you a hint. Imagine a research study and the research study says, well, this drug X is just amazing. It gives you the desired effect and the probability of the side effects happening to you is 0.001%. And people say, oh, that's an amazing drug. This is a revolution in the medical field. What these doofuses did not tell you, that these numbers fit the D form only. However, the actual drug in the actual world is like 20% D form and 80% of the L form. And in this case, the L form had way, 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 way more side effects that happen in about 25% of patients. This drug is not terrific after all. That's why there was a famous scientist at Stanford who said, most scientific research is false and misleading. 
So when you're reporting your findings, please be honest, don't be a pathetic piece of melon. What is tachyphylaxis? Well, the word tachy means rapid, phylaxis means protection. What does prophylaxis mean? Pro means before, phylaxis means protection. Oh, I want to protect myself from having something in the future. This is prophylaxis. What is anaphylaxis? Ana means up. That's why we call it anatomy. Ana means up, tomy means to cut. So anatomy literally means to cut you up. Tachy is rapid. Example of a tachyphylaxis is nitrates tachyphylaxis. What's the, the problem here? Uh, you give me nitrates, I respond. You give me nitrates, I respond. But the more you give me nitrates, I respond less. Tachyphylaxis. It's a rapid and short-term onset of drug tolerance. Rapid and short-term. That was the problem. What's the solution? Nitrate-free intervals. Nitrate holidays. What the flip is cross-tolerance. If you give me drug X for a long period of time, I will develop tolerance, which means you give me the drug X and I will not respond. But not only I will develop tolerance to X, I will develop tolerance to any drug that looks remotely similar to X. And this is called cross-tolerance, even if I have never seen the new drug before. Pause and review. Inhaled anesthetics are here. All of them are halogenated hydrocarbons except nitrous oxide. Let's talk about halothane. Are you halogenated? Of course, I'm halo. Yeah, of course, I'm halogenated. But however, I do not have an ether component in me. And that's why I am cardiotoxic, hashtag ventricular tachycardia. Some measurable characteristics of the inhaled anesthetic include the minimal alveolar concentration we have discussed it before in this playlist, blood gas partition coefficient, we have talked about it before, and stability, which means metabolism and the exothermic reaction. A medication is said to be unstable if it's metabolized rapidly. But what is exothermic reaction? Exothermic reaction is a reaction that produces lots and lots of heat. That's an exothermic, not endothermic, which consumes the heat. For instance, an inhaled anesthetic plus some carbon dioxide can give you tons of heat to the point of explosion. Oh, these inhaled anesthetic could be flammable. In my pulmonology playlist, we have talked about oxygen. Oxygen is in the air. Oxygen is breathed in, enters into the lung, leaves your alveoli and jump onto the blood. Now oxygen is in the arterial blood, then jumps onto the hemoglobin of the red blood cell and then goes to the tissue, gas exchange, jumps on the hemoglobin. Who's jumping now? Carbon dioxide. Okay. And then venous blood, lungs, and breathe the carbon dioxide out. Let's call them names. Oxygen in the atmosphere is FiO2. Oxygen in the alveoli is P big AO2. Big A is for alveolar. Oxygen in the arterial blood is P small AO2, A for arterial, and then jumps on the hemoglobin. This is the hemoglobin saturation, SAO2. Oxygen in the vein is, of course, lower than oxygen in the arterial blood. So in the vein, it's called the PVO2, and then back. If you want to be a great anesthesiologist, you need to balance the P big A of the inhaled anesthetic with the P small A in the arterial blood of the freaking anesthetic and with the P brain, the partial pressure of the anesthetic in the brain. If you get them in harmony, if you get that dialed in and figured out, you'll be a wonderful anesthesiologist. Go back to watch my previous video in pharmacokinetics. This is the most important slide. And don't forget, in order to achieve complete elimination of any drug, you need about five half-lives. Question of the day. Let's say that I gave the patient two drugs together, an opioid and a freaking benzodiazepine. What would I get? A synergy, additive, or an antagonistic effect? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the correct answer in the next video. If you want to learn about cardiac pharmacology, antihyperlipidemics, antiarrhythmics, antianginal, antihypertensive diuretics, digoxin, check out my cardiac pharmacology course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. Or you can get the ultimatum, my antibiotics course. Talking about antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications at medicosisperfectionalis.com. There is no subscription. You just download it once and keep it for you forever. The next anesthesiology video is going to talk about how to manage the airway. And we'll have the 10 commandments of airway management. It's going to be so epic. I love you guys. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium antibiotics course and my CNS pharmacology course. Also, you can get my cardiac pharmacology course, my acid-based course, etc. If you've watched the previous video on pharmacokinetics and this video on pharmacodynamics and you download my premium courses from my website, you can kiss pharmacology goodbye for the most part. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.